All right, good afternoon and welcome to Fraud Education's free webinar series on college admissions and standardized testing during COVID-19. My name is Ibrahim Farat and I'm the Chief Educational Consultant for Fraud Education. Thank you for joining us today. We have over 91 attendees today on the line, uh, live on Zoom, um, most of whom are school counselors from school districts in various parts of Texas, as well as parents and some students as well. So thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Today, I'm joined by my two colleagues from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, as well as Plano Frisco McKinney, Dr. Nishan Jones from Dallas-Fort Worth, and Chris Stafford from Plano Frisco McKinney, Texas. Today's focus, if you've been to our previous webinars, is specifically about colleges and schools in the Texas area. So we're gonna cover North Texas, uh, where my colleagues are from, and then I will cover the South Texas region as well, even though changes have been mostly uniform in the Texas area. A little bit about myself for those who haven't met me yet. I am the co-founder and chief educational consultant for Fraud Education. We've been, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years um, and 12 years with Fraud Education. I've started off as a SAT and ACT tutor um, and clocked in over about 10,000 hours of it. And then moved into college admissions consulting, clocked in over 14,000 hours. I have published uh, nine books in college and school admissions around the country. Um, my students have had over a thousand college acceptances, 38 of which were IVs, uh, 14 of which were international schools. I have personally visited over 280 colleges and my students have earned over $88 million in total merit-based scholarships. Um, I'm a member of NACAC, National Association for College Admissions Counseling, as well as TACAC, Texas Admissions Counsel uh, Counseling Association, and a professional member for I the IECA, Independent Educational Consultants Association, and a board member as well. So I will let my colleague, Dr. Nishan Jones, introduce herself as well. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Nishan Jones, and I'm based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, I have I've been an educational consultant for about over 20 years, working with students and families, and been with the Farat uh, since February of 2020. Um, I've consulted about 800 students in college admission, uh, as well as financial aid and affordability. I have, um, have acceptance of over 1,200 uh, students being accepted into college, of which 25 our Ivy League acceptance and visited a lot of campuses um, over the years and over 22, well, 2 million in total merit based scholarships. Um, I uh, have publications of um, the, my dissertation was exploring the acquisition of social capital among ethnically diverse first generation upper class students at a four year institution. institution. Um, I have a doctorate in higher education and certifications from UCLA in college admission counseling and a certificate at Harvard University in college admission. I'm a part of, of the um, Independent Educational Consultant Association. I'm just glad to be with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. Thanks for joining us today. And Chris. Hello, everyone. And Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chris Stafford. I am based in the Plano Frisco McKinney area. Um, I am the youngin in this group. I have 10 years in uh, education. Uh, I've worked and served uh, over a thousand students in the college admissions process. I am new to college admissions consulting. I've just joined the Farat team in February of 2020. Um, at this point, I have one Ivy League acceptance and counting. Um, I have visited over 75 colleges and universities. Um, and one of my goals is to uh, catch up to Ibrahim and surpass his number. Um, <laughs> I am a member of NACAC and TACAC as well. And I have anticipated membership to IECA. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. 
A little bit about Front Education. We were founded in 2008, um, served over a thousand students, and we have 11 consultants uh, like Chris and Dr. Nishan Jones around the country in nine different cities. We have two office locations physically in the Houston area, but reach globally via the Zoom platform. Uh, and I've been doing it for five plus years now via Zoom, even though it's a new thing for a lot of the world today. Um, and our students have earned um, an ACT score growth of nine points from baseline to the finish um, after our program, and then the SAT score of 390 points from baseline to finish. And 98% of our students have been admitted to at least one of their top two choices of college. So we're very proud of these metrics and we keep collecting those metrics on a regular basis. What are we going to cover today is mainly go through strategies and typical timelines for college admissions and standardized testing pre-COVID-19 times. What is typically our advice for students 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades? Um, and then look at how has COVID-19 disrupted the regular flow in admissions and testing and what can you do now? And then finally, I, we will get to your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom, which you have access to throughout the presentation today. So if you have a burning question in your head while we're talking, please go ahead and hit the Q&A button, type up your question, and we will get to as much of the questions as possible given the time frame at the end of our presentation today. So I will like to start with uh, the top factors for college admissions um, historically. And, and I think this doesn't change as much uh, even during COVID or after COVID-19 crisis has passed. We have seven factors that college admissions look at for admissions. Top one factor has never changed, which is GPA and or your class rank in high school. Number two is how you attain that GPA and rank. How much did you push yourself through APs, advanced classes, IB classes, honors classes, and earn that GPA and or rank? Number three factor is the SAT or ACT scores. Number four is the quality of the essays that you write for college admissions, whether this is the um, main essay that goes to every college or the supplemental essays that are typically asked for by each and an individual college. Relevant activities or leadership, this goes back to the student's resume in and outside of school activities that they do that are relevant to what they wanna study in college and beyond. Strong recommendation, recommendation letters. So we have some school counselors in the, in the um, presentation today. So your recommendation letters, the strength of those recommendation letters and the relevance of those letters to the student's strengths, really, as you also know, really play a big role in this presentation, in the admissions process. And then of course, uh, teacher recommendations as well. And finally, this has been more of a new factor in college admissions, uh, the family's ability to pay. So whether the student needs uh, needs-based financial aid or actually will be uh, needs aid free. So this has been a, a, a more of a recent um, factor, but it's probably going to change much after this crisis is over. Typically ninth graders are, we advise them to um, test out of intro level math and foreign language courses. They can follow the advanced path, um, but they should also take as many honors and AP classes as possible without sacrificing their freshman GPA. We wanna make sure that they're positioned for success by the end of their junior year and the first semester of 12th grade. For standardized testing, we don't recommend ninth graders to take any sort of standardized testing except for maybe APs and SAT subject tests. And then college admissions, they can't really do much. It's their adjustment year to high school, researching online and maybe visiting nearby colleges. And of course, these two last two pieces are impacted quite a bit and we'll talk about that with our panelists today. And 10th graders, again, they take as many honors AP advanced courses as possible, but they need to maintain a solid GPA. 10th graders also are advised in their middle of their 10th grade, which is right about now for many of the class of 2022, identify whether the SAT or ACT is the best test for them and start working through that test and continue on SAT subject tests as well. On the college admission side, we recommend 10th graders to identify their path, what kind of student they are, are they English language arts, are they social sciences, are they STEM, 
so that they can start limiting the advanced level courses they take 11th and 12th grades. And of course, start identifying the best fit colleges as well by doing research and visiting. 11th graders um, are asked to limit their honors AP advanced level courses in their target areas mainly, unless they can handle the other side of um, the, the, the areas as well. Like let's say the STEM student is also really good at history and English, you know, and they're not really going to be hurt by that in terms of their grades, by all means, go for all of those, but limit it if you're not so sure. And then just looking at the colleges that you're targeting, you can look at the admitted classes GPA range for the previous classes and see possibly the range is 3.2 to 3.6. We recommend our juniors to shoot for a 3.4 plus cumulative GPA, um, especially by pulling up their grades in 11th grade. For standardized testing, kicking their SAT, ACT prep in high gear. So for the fall semester that has just passed, hopefully they've started prepping, they've taken practice tests and started taking the official tests in the spring. Even if you've just taken the January and February tests for SAT and ACT, you're in good shape as a junior. If you have not taken any, you should not panic because we have some advice to come forth for you. But this is the time to really try to finish standardized testing, especially. And in terms of the scores that you should be targeting, again, going back to your college list, if the admitted class's average ACT scores is 26 to 30, we're hoping that you should shoot for 28 plus. So the factor for SAT or ACT is covered on your end. And on the college admission side, of course, visit colleges and try to narrow down your list. Uh, for 12th graders, uh, the academics is uh, the only thing you can do here is really maintaining your fall semester GPA at or above your cumulative average and still limit your honors and AP classes. Standardized testing, not much is recommended. Hopefully you're done with them by senior year. But again, those are a little bit disrupted with what's going on today. Um, on the college admissions side, most of our seniors are advised and are required to make their decision by May 1 of their senior year, which is coming up in a couple of weeks here, and apply by November 1 of their senior year so they can maximize their chances of admissions as well as merit-based scholarships. So when the situation was like this, and then COVID-19 hit, we have had remaining you know, headlines coming up as breaking news in college admissions. Boston University goes test optional. Davidson goes test optional. College admissions is now being disrupted and being redesigned, driving colleges to, to go test optional. And then SAT, ACT tests are canceled for April, May, and possibly June. We don't know yet. We'll, we'll find out quite soon. University of California, which is the largest university system in the country, has gone test optional and minimum GPA requirements waived. So what does all this mean? So that's what we're gonna talk about today with our um, colleagues, Chris and Dr. Nishan Jones here, uh, specifically with regards to Texas schools and Texas colleges. So I would like to start by asking a question uh, to Chris. So Chris, you're in the Plano, McKinney, uh, Frisco area. Um, you're surrounded by school districts as well as private schools in your region. What academic disruptions have you seen that's been happening in your local districts as well as private schools with regards to school closures as well as remote learning? And many families are worried about this remote learning and the viability of uh, the learning that takes place. So can you tell us a little bit about what's happening and what's your advice, what, what your advice is? Yeah, so in terms of disruptions in the Plano Frisco McKinney area, um, as of this week, uh, Plano ISD has announced that they are going to a pass-fail system. Same with Richardson ISD, um, and we are seeing uh, other school districts make similar announcements, and we're hearing uh, similar information from the school, other school districts and privates in the area. Um, school closures have been announced by Governor Abbott until May 4th, uh, but we are seeing uh, districts locally and across the state announce closures until the end of the school year, um, taking it a step beyond that May 4th uh, date. 
Um, so it's there, this pass fail system is one that we're seeing and all of our school districts and privates have transferred over to an online platform for learning. Um, so in this case, uh, my advice for students that are taking courses online is to remain engaged, uh, to take those courses seriously. Yes, they, they may be pass fail, uh, but one thing to keep in mind is with colleges and universities uh, and teachers letters, teacher letter of recommendations for juniors is to know that uh, a letter of recommendation is going to highlight your, uh, how you were doing in the course, whether it was the, the virtual aspect of the course or prior to that as well. So that's just uh, some advice and I'll touch on a little bit more as we, okay. as we delve awesome. deeper. Uh, Nishan, can you uh, add on to what Chris said in terms of what your advice would be in terms of remote learning opportunities that aro arose for the students and of course the pass fail grading system, which many families are really worried about this, especially those who are juniors. Uh, what does it mean for them? Is it going to hurt their cumulative GPA and so on? Sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, we are all in a time where there are a lot of uncertainties and um, these are things that we're not accustomed to. And so um, some districts um, are going to pass and fail, but you do have some districts that are still holding our students accountable uh, and actually given a grade. And so it's important for you first to know, know exactly where your district uh, stands in regards to pass fail. I, I know in, in Austin, there is a, a, a pass incomplete and you really need to know exactly what does that mean. And in regards to what you can do, I, I will agree with Chris that is that you need to remain engaged in your classroom. I, I highly recommend that uh, you set a schedule up, you know, uh, each day to tackle all your classes. You know, you may not tackle them all, you know, every day, but you have a schedule in place, um, as well as being in communication outside of Zoom with your instructor so that he or she knows that you are interested, you are engaged. Um, if you have any questions, these, these are the times where you need to ask the questions about your homework or any quizzes. Just um, keep a journal um, so that you know exactly what's going on. And the reason why I say that is because this is gonna play a major role uh, in your essay writing, um, perhaps you didn't do as well in your class, you want to be able to articulate to college admissions um, what was going on during that time and how you brought your grade up, um, but you want to, your teacher to know who you are, and so they can actually write a good letter of recommendation of how you've increased in your scores or actually what happened. So to, to, to piggyback off of that, what if we have a student who was like super high achieving 90 plus average on an AP class and then the school went past fail. And then on the flip side, the student who may have barely got by with a 70 average and you know, also the school went past fail. Now both of those students are gonna get a pass, right? In the transcript. So how can the families in both ends of the spectrum there um, can take advantage of this or not lose a chance uh, for college admissions? Sure. I, I think it's important to bring context into pass fail, right? Because a pass is a pass, but you want to know, okay, did this uh, admissions going to want to know, did this student make a, an 89 or 90? And so that's when your teacher can explain exactly what level of pass that student had um, and be able to articulate, you know, this student did sort well in the midst of changing to the system. Um, um, they were able to work independently. And so, you know, in college, that's what you have to do. You have to work independently. Um, this student was engaged. Um, and so they want to know that this student is going to be able to to succeed in college. And so this is uh, actually a great time for you to explain to admissions your ability to be successful in the classroom uh, working independently. 
Excellent. Excellent then, advice. Chris? Just to piggyback off of that, I, I just want to say in addition for that student that may have a 70 and is going to a pass fail system, this isn't the time to uh, take a step back to uh, just get over a, a 60 in order to pass the course. This is the time to show that you're willing to step up and uh, stay vigilant throughout this uh, virtual learning, remote learning uh, state that we're in. And a teacher can also speak to that, that change in that growth process, transitioning from uh, in-class learning to virtual learning as well. Excellent point. Thank you, Chris. And to to go off of the, the school context, especially in Texas, uh, the big news came through beginning or middle of March about the STAR testing uh, being canceled um, for the remainder of the school year, which turned out to be a, quite a relief for many families and students. But what are the implications of STAR tests being canceled in terms of readiness for next class year? And then also uh, being for college admissions, if, if at all. Chris, let's go to you first about this. Okay. So in terms of STAR testing uh, being canceled, I think it takes a, a huge burden off of our, our students uh, going through this process, the students that, um, may not, that may not have passed all of their STAR EOC exams. And I, I think it's important to remember that even though the, the STAR test uh, is not a requirement at this point, um, to continue to, uh, again, engage with the, the coursework if you uh, struggle in uh, any of the courses where you had to take an EOC exam, remember to still ask for that help, ask for that support, uh, making sure that your understanding and engaging with the content because it isn't it's important to have that knowledge and understanding going into uh, a college setting and getting ready for college prepared excellent uh nishan uh star testing anything to add you know i think that um this is actually the opportunity for the state to see how valuable the test is um i mean it's been a great burden on teachers and students the anxiety of it all and um i would agree that um you know it's important to uh continue to to be engaged with test taking and standardized tests um, chris will talk a little bit about um the tsi which is required at uh, most of the universities and, and what you need to do to be prepared for that. Um, but I think it was a great call uh, uh, that Governor Abbott made in regards to uh, counseling for this year. Um, Chris, so let's go to TSI requirement because this is a requirement for most um, two-year and four-year institutions publicly in the, in the Texas area. So yeah. TSI being canceled has different <laughs> meanings for uh, college-bound students. So what does it mean and is it a good thing, is it bad, and how, is, uh, how are the colleges uh, going to assess now given that there's no TSI? <laughs> So at this point, um, at this point in time, TSI has not officially been canceled. Um, they do plan on uh, making a decision before May 1, depending on the state of things at that time. Uh, so the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, the governing body that oversees TSI, is uh, they're updating their website almost on a daily basis. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with TSI is they have offered a remote option for uh, a while at this point. And uh, through that process, uh, there is a fee associated with taking the TSI exam remote, um, but TEA uh, is covering exam fees and test proctoring fees uh, for the reading and math sections only. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. And if there is, let's say, a technology issue for a student that is required to take the TSI, um, I highly recommend reaching out to the college or university that you plan on uh, enrolling in and going to, to uh, speak with them about their, their TSI requirements and to see if there are any alternatives to taking that exam. Excellent. So um, to 
kind of piggyback off of the star concept as well, APs. And APs are typically used for, um, you know, college credit purposes, right? So you can kind of test out of your intro level courses in college and eventually save money. And, you know, you can graduate earlier. So it has a lot of benefits. But APs have gone online, shorter period of time, 45 minutes long, and open book, as College Board has stated. So how, do, how are the colleges in the Texas area, public and private, going to assess the AP test results from students who have taken this coming round in May? A four or a five is typically a pass and typically a test out. Is that still going to be the case? Nishan, let's go to you first. Yes, I, I, I do believe that this is something that will be taken into consideration even more, right? Um, so um, I strongly encourage you to get with your institution that you are applying to, uh, to see how this would be uh, applied. Um, take advantage of the fact that, you know, the new standards of it's going to be 45 minutes, it's going to be an open book opportunity. Um, for your exam to be proctored. Um, you know, this is a time where, you know, amid so many different things have gone on, um, but for us to take advantage of what we do have, right? Um, so that you are geared and ready to showcase to the institution that you are capable to weather through the storm, you are capable to, uh, of, of doing what you need to do uh, and showing them that you can pass these exams. So um, I strongly encourage you to take um, as many exams as you can. There is a, uh, a timeline on uh, the College Board website. Please look at that. Take advantage of the deadlines um, and make sure that you register for that and be prepared um, because colleges are gonna, they're looking at what are you doing now? You know, everybody is in disarray. What are you doing now? And how are you taking advantage of the time that you have and that you're invested in your education? Excellent advice. Chris, anything to add for the APs? Yes, just uh, along those same lines, uh, taking advantage of what you do have. Uh, remember that even with an open book exam, that doesn't mean don't study. That doesn't mean don't prepare. Um, because a book can sit in front of you if you don't, if you're not able to find the answers within a finite amount of time, um, it, it doesn't benefit you to have uh, an open book exam. So I think making sure that you are truly preparing yourselves for AP exams is crucial to this process and knowing that colleges and universities are, are also, they're looking at what you're doing now, what you're doing to prepare. And yes, they may, uh, expect uh, fours or fives on the AP exam. And, yeah. and so this, I, think, I think you made a good point about the open book concept because the open book sounds easier, but typically an open book exam is known to be harder because they're not going to necessarily ask you the questions you can directly find the answers of. It will require critical thinking, which is what APs are all about. So the answers are not gonna be easy to find. So you still have to know your basics and then you know, critically think and answer those questions accordingly. So totally, totally agreed on that, on that piece. Um, the only piece is I guess the, the, the colleges have really not responded to the college board's um, readjustment of the APs at this time in terms of whether they're gonna take the fours and fives as credits or, or not. But I, you know, given the situation that we all are in, colleges will be or will be making adjustments as they went. So there has been no formal announcement at this time. So I'd like to go through the SAT and ACT now worries, especially, especially because we are in Texas. And as you know, we have many rolling admissions schools in our state um, with some colleges opening their application periods as early as July 1, like Texas A&M does. And we've always told our students, hey, if you're thinking about A&M or any of the rolling admission schools, you apply early, you get in early. That's typically been the advice. Given where we are today, juniors, some of them have not even taken the SAT or ACT yet. So their application is technically not even complete to apply to a Texas A&M or a similar institution. Um, given where they are with the AT and ACT for juniors and some younger as well, um, what do you think they should do, you know, in terms of 
testing? Should they just wait and sh or should they just hope for the best that our colleges will go test optional? So Ms. Sean, let's go to you first. Sure. Um, I, I think that um, juniors should be prepared. Um, this test is not going away. Um, you need to actually put in at least an hour a day of, of taking an exam or studying for an exam. There are materials. There are so many re free resources that are out there for you to study. Uh, you know, College Board to be able to go and download some, download some information where you can study. Uh, looking at testing strategies or even looking at various resources where there are tutors that are available. This is a time where you can focus because you're not going to school. This is a time where um, your scores, they matter. And so you want to make sure that you are being engaged with, your, uh, with the SAT and the ACT, identifying what tests actually uh, works for you, what you would do well in, um, whether it's the ACT or the SAT, you want to be able to uh, understand the strategies of taking that test. So during this time, um, you know, while some states and institutions are waiving uh, its test optional, um, I will say that, you know, a lot of what you do on the SAT or the S ACT, how you perform, uh, married scholars, you know, that that is that comes into play. So be prepared um, to take the exam. And for that, um, I'm pretty sure that the A&M system will evaluate uh, admissions considering, you know, the time. And if you have not taken that exam, there are plenty of opportunities, I will say, even through Farad, where you can take uh, the test and see exactly where you are. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, just along those same lines, just remember to uh, stay vigilant with your preparation for SAT or ACT. One day these exams uh, may be at home, they may be online. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are going into this summer in particular ready. And that's, that's advice primarily for our juniors. For freshmen and sophomores going through this process, it's a little too soon to uh, be worried about uh, the ACT or SAT, you have time. Uh, I, we recommend slowly starting to prepare to determine which exam is better for you, the SAT or the ACT, but you do not necessarily have to go into the summer uh, ready and studying fully for uh, an exam coming up in the fall. So, uh, you know, I, I think both of you have uh, kind of uh, not worried our viewers, but I think you gave the answer that no one really wanted to hear, which, you know, <laughs> you got to continue SAT and ACT uh, as if it's going to be on sometime soon in whatever shape or form, whether this is online or at home, in person, you know, new sites, whatever. So that's what I'm hearing. And I think that's particularly because of the big, two big systems we have, University of Texas and then Texas A&M system. Um, have not made any official announcement and have released information about being, um, you know, monitoring the situation as they call it in quotes, uh, but they have not made any sort of determination for the class of 2021 or any of the, um, of the other classes, whether they're going to go test optional. Uh, so more and more of private colleges in Texas have been pushing for test optional and uh, I guess test blind policies. So Nishan, I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, give us some of your uh, knowledge about some private colleges in Texas that, you know, pretty much said, you know what, if you haven't taken the SAT, ACT, don't worry about it. We're not going to even look at it. Um, or that you can submit if you want to. Yes, um, I think, you know, in speaking with some private institutions, um, they are going to take a holistic view of your entire application. So um, what does that mean for you uh, in regards to uh, your application, I, I think that you need to be able to highlight um, through your essay um, where you've been and where you are. And, and I, I highly encourage the journaling, as I stated earlier, of, of some of the times of 
you know, what you've gone through uh, via COVID-19. Um, I, I think it's important for you to talk about your journey and, and really highlight that. Um, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your instructors where you did have um, some of those subjects where you did have a difficult time, but then you brought those grades up um, so that they can write you a strong letter of recommendation um, and have those on file. Um, those are those are areas of where where the admissions officers can get a clear picture about who you are and who you're going to be as a student. Um, being able to keep your grades up, that's why we say stay, remain engaged, regardless of what uh, is passed or failed, because they may look at your class rank and not particularly your GPA. I mean, there's a whole lot of uh, things that they are going to look at holistically in your application. One of the things that I would encourage you to do is um, going back to the AP exams or whatever, create a study group. Um, you know, uh, uh, be a leader of a study group, um, even in the sessions that you have with your classroom, you can show that leadership skills there. If you were part of, you know, an organization on campus, are you remaining engaged? Um, are you having some of those committee meetings, you know, to discuss some of the concerns? Those are ways that you can display your leadership and articulate uh, to the college admissions of who you are as a student in these trying times. So I know that uh, private schools will look at that beyond um, your SAT score. Excellent, thank you very much. And now, now my next question is coming to Chris. Chris, um, in your region, we have some of the most popular uh, Texas institutions, private and public. Um, now that colleges are closed, visit, visiting is closed as well. You know, how are our seniors 2020 uh, going to make a decision as to which, you know, campus to go to for the next four years of their lives, given where we are today? And what do you recommend? Yes. So for our, our seniors uh, making that final choice, um, keep in mind that uh, for College Decision Day, uh, there are several colleges and universities in Texas that have uh, moved their deadline. They pushed their deadline from May 1 to June 1st, and uh, just in reaching out to a few schools that do still have May 1 deadlines, if that is something that might pose an, an issue to you, they highly recommend reaching out and speaking with an admissions representative. Um, so for students that are feeling a lot of pressure about making that choice in the next few weeks, keep in mind that if you do need more time you should reach out and ask for that additional time to make that final choice. Um, also, in addition to that, uh, if it is a, a college or university that you have not visited yet, um, every most schools throughout Texas are doing virtual visits and virtual tours. Um, in addition to that, going through their websites and their traditional means, we also recommend tapping into the alumni population at a lot of uh, the schools in the area. Uh, most schools have a, an alumni page on Facebook as, as one place. Other schools, if you reach out to admissions and uh, ask to get connected with a, a current student, they are willing and able to do that and connect you in that way. Uh, so that's just some of the advice that I would give to a senior trying to make that final decision. Make sure you are, are staying informed, you're, you're learning as much about the, the college universities that you're deciding between. I, I really like the alumni contact piece because, um, you know, many people just rely on the online resources, whether this is data or videos, virtual tours, but reaching out to the alumni and getting insider view on colleges is really a good, good advice. So thank you, Chris, for that. And Nishan, I'll ask you the same question, but I'll add on another question because obviously the seniors, yes, May 1 deadline, some of them pushed it back to June 1 or later. Uh, and some of them pretty much said May 1 strictly, but then there are, you have some options, I understand for, for some of that as well. Um, so you talk to us about those options and then two, what if we have, you know, juniors and younger who are looking to figure out their college list? I mean, what should they do in terms of uh, the fact that they cannot visit colleges now? Sure. Um, I, I think that um, there, there is a website you can go to to see exactly if the deadline has been extended or not. 
um, you want to go directly to the institution's website, but I am aware in Texas, the fallen schools who have ex extended their deadline uh, to June 1st, and that's Austin College, Baylor University, Texas Christian University, Texas Lutheran University, Texas State uh, University, St. Edward's University, University of Dallas, University of Incarnate Word, Southwestern University, and University of St. Thomas. So those are the ones who have extended their deadline um, to June 1st. Um, if I did not mention that they have not, the other schools have not declared that they have extended, they still have the deadline of decision of, for May 1st. But I uh, admonish you to um, reach out to the admissions office if you need an extension, if you really need to take more time to decide, you know, amid everything that's gone on, I really need to take time, reach out to them directly via email and call them and see if you can get an extension. Um, and speaking with one particular private school on yesterday, um, they did articulate that, um, that they are adhering to the May 1st deadline, but um, I think that um, they said that they would um, extend it if, if the, it was requested upon the student. They would look at that. And so as we get closer to the deadline, um, I, I think that there probably will be a shift, right? Um, because they want more students to decide and make a decision. But I want you to take your time and make the best decision because this is an investment and things have changed in your world, right? Um, as it relates to juniors, so guess what? This is a time where you can take your best vacation ever and have fun and you're gonna do it virtually. So we have a few options that you can do. You can go to the website of the institution of your interest. Some of these um, institutions are providing a chat, a live chat where you can chat with the admission. You can go a live tour. I cannot remember the, the institution, but there's one institution, um, I think it's a UT system where they were, the president was actually given a tour. So um, you want to be able to have some engagement there. Go to some of the Facebook student groups, ask some questions. Um, these are some of the things that you would do anyway, visiting the colleges. Um, we encourage you to go to uh, several sites that we can mention in regards to, and I'll get those, it's youvisit, y-o-u-visit.com um, for virtual tours. Uh, campus real campus r e e l dot org um, that's another way which you can visit various college and get credit because they want to know that you're interested in the university and so you want to get on their list right um, you want to be able to have that conversation with admissions officers so um, those are ways what you can take your own tour. So let's just say, we're going to Florida today. Get your parents in front of the TV and say, we're going to Florida, yeah. So you go to the, to the schools at Florida and say, oh, well, next week we're going to uh, do a Texas tour. You know, make it creative, make it fun, and also journal it. Journal your experience, highlight what you like about the, the college so that you can create a list that is for you and best fit for you. That's that's really good advice, and I like the idea of hey, let's go Florida now, right? That's a, that's that's really really awesome. And I think what what I also will hear is that you know you you need to make your visits count. So in terms of uh, demonstrated interest is which has been a big part of college admissions for so long, especially for those families who could afford to visit in person. Now, obviously, we cannot visit whether or not you can afford to visit. Now we have a virtual option. So when the colleges offer this option, they're now asking you to register on their website for their virtual tour and info session, attend the live virtual tour and info session. That way they can count you as present. And that's what will count as um, you've attended and demonstrated interest to the college for those colleges that this really matters to. Um, I have a follow-up question about the seniors. This comes up a lot, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks. 
I have had seniors myself who's, who've been awarded financial aid from the institution of their choice based on their FAFSA and CSS profile. And with everything that's been going on now that unemployment number in the United States has risen to 16.8 million, chances are that we have many seniors out there whose financial aid offer is not good enough. So what do they do? They cannot afford this college unless there's some sort of update, some sort of change. What's happened is many of them start to refill, refill the FAFSA, CSS profile, and we tell them, no, no. So what can they do given this situation, Chris, and, and then Nishan? Given this situation, we highly recommend do not reapply for FAFSA. Uh, I repeat, do not reapply for FAFSA. Um, reach out to your school and explain your situation. It is really important during this time to provide that context, uh, whether it is a loss of employment, whether it is a, a furlough, um, that context is key and crucial in this, in this situation. And uh, financial aid offices are reevaluating, they will reevaluate your financial aid package given the information that you do provide for them. Thank you. Nishan? Yes, um, this is something that I think you need to know anyway. You need to know who your financial advisor is. Um, they know you, you know them, and um, they are able to provide you information. Do not, as, as Chris has articulated, do not redo your or submit your um, financial aid application or CSS profile reach out, know who your advisor is, and let them know the changes that um, are, have taken place so that they can adjust your financial aid accordingly. Excellent. And uh, I'm about to go to the Q&A. We have a couple of them coming through already, but I have one more question that came through before the webinar, so I want to ask that question first. Um, the question is for um, institutions like UT system and A&M system that do rank and auto admit based on that rank. Um, do the pass, does the pass fail system hurt or how is that going to really impact these, this ranking system uh, for the class of 2021 uh, and beyond? I mean, even if you have a freshman, then if they've just gone pass fail, how is this going to show in terms of the GPA and in terms of the ranking when it comes to the auto admits? Nishan, let's go to you first. Sure. Um, you know, I have to go back to being able to explain your pass fail. Um, you know, you are only limited to what you have, right? And so institutions, I believe, are going to do due diligence and going through uh, your full application and taking a consideration holistically what's going on um, with uh, COVID-19 and your ability to uh, demonstrate your grades. And so that's why it's very important for you to um, articulate in your essay. Um, this is a time for you to get with your English teacher and, you know, write out some essays and let them um, edit it and highlight that and as I said it er, I stated earlier it's important for them to students to be engaged uh, with their relevant um, activities and demonstrate that in a resume form um, so I will say that um, colleges are going to start looking at things holistically uh, and uh, as well as your 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 class rank is important um, and so you may not have an auto admit but you're going to see a lot of cases where students just don't have that, um, the, the, the GPA to show. And so we have to look at things holistically. So you're, you're expecting potentially the auto admit to be suspended temporarily, at least until, you know, this group of students have gone and graduated, essentially. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess, pretty much. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Chris, anything to add? Um, just along those same lines is to remember that we are all going through this. Uh, it's not just high schools that are affected, colleges and universities, businesses are affected by uh, COVID-19 and there will be a lot of changes. We cannot predict all the changes that will, that will come, but there will potentially be 
more changes as uh, time goes by. So I think uh, just staying informed uh, as information comes in, uh, I know that we will do our job to share that information out with, with all of you, with everyone that's listening in. Uh, so be mindful of just the information that continues to come in and uh, still with all of your, your classes perform as if it's, it's business as usual and you need to make sure you're passing um, with flying colors and you're understanding all the content and the material that you are covering, whether it is uh, a graded course or pass fail. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to the Q&A uh, responses now, uh, questions. First question comes from, uh, uh, comes about uh, TSI information, Chris, that you provided. Uh, the question is, where did you get your remote TSI information and the information about uh, reimbursement from the TEA? Yes. So great question. Thank you for that. So Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board had a webinar um, a week ago that I participated in and that's where they shared that information. I will follow up and find the slides and share those with Ibrahim to share out with all of our viewers afterwards. Thank you. And then the next question is, uh, do you think this is more of a speculative question, obviously, Texas state institutions will move to test optional. And then the second part of that question is, have you heard about College Board offering at home SAT? So Nishan, let's go to you first and then we'll go to Chris and I'll also add on. Yes, I participated in a webinar um, with a representative from ACT and they have had already been looking at proctoring um, the ACT uh, from home, and um, they are uh, have gone through a few um, testing um, agencies to see exactly how this would work out. Um, so the, it is true that ACT will be looking at offering ACT remotely, um, and um, I, I think that you know with the test test options, I think that that's something that each institution will carefully look at according to where they are. And so um, we will keep you abreast with what we hear and learn um, as we move forward. Okay, Chris, yeah. any of those two questions? Yes. Um, in regards to test optional, I, again, uh, I wanna say that it is, it is early in this process. And um, as we continue to see other, uh, networks of schools, other private colleges and universities announced that they're shifting and moving to test optional that may apply some pressure to the, the colleges and universities in Texas. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, there are no uh, rumblings of moving to test optional for the larger state systems, UT, a and and the Texas Tech system, but with um, each one of those systems, they are uh, creating webinars, they're continuing to announce changes and updates. And again, as Nishan touched on, as that information comes in, we will make sure to share it out. And I think you both touched on this, it's very dynamic. So to put my two cents into this, where we are as um, college admissions professionals, we are uh, up to date with everything that's been announced on a minute by minute basis as of Thursday, April 9th, 12.54 p.m., <laughs> there is no indicator that Texas state schools are going test optional. At 1.01 p.m., we might hear that they have gone test optional. So, but as of today, no indication whatsoever. Um, now, let's keep in mind that University of California system, which is the largest, you know, publicly public institution system in the country, has gone test optional. I think this Personally, and having been in this for 15 plus years now, that is going to put some pressure into other public university systems around the country, um, at least temporarily suspending the SAT ACT requirement. Having said that, that announcement may come as early as five minutes from now, as late as May 31st. We don't know. Uh, but as of today, no indication whatsoever. More and more private schools are going test optional. Now, 
the second question uh, from the same person was about college board offering at home or online SAT. So just yesterday, uh, the college board CEO has participated in a webinar that I have attended personally, and that they are finalizing a pilot um, for an online SAT, given that they've been, they've designed the AP um, online as well. Uh, it wasn't a difficult transition for them. So while it is not as certain in terms of timeline and the details as the ACT is, as Nishan mentioned in terms of July or September online offerings, SAT is coming home and online pretty soon as an option. We just don't know when yet, but it's probably as early as this fall. So well, let me see if I, uh, we have answered all the questions. Uh, looks like we have that, are, that were open. So if you have any final thoughts and questions, please go ahead and post them. But I would like to turn it back over to my panelists and give us their kind of 30 second, 40 second, um, you know, speed uh, words of wisdom for our high schoolers, for our counselors who are listening, as well as for our parents on what should they do? I'll go, I'll go first. Um, in this process, uh, I think it, there are a lot of, it's a lot of uncertainty. There's a, a lot of uh, angst as we, as we go through this. I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to a junior, senior, freshman, and sophomore is to uh, remember um, that, that initial slide that was put up, what's important in the college admissions process. Yes, there, there may be some shifts and changes, um, but for the most part, that list will remain the same and consistent. Curriculum rigor, es essays, relevant activities and leadership. So lean into those aspects of, uh, that you do have some control over, uh, whether it is taking on a, a new initiative while you are working remote, finding a way to uh, volunteer in a remote capacity, uh, leading a, a study group as Nishana mentioned earlier. Um, so hone in on those aspects of your application that will be important. Thank you, Chris. Nishan? Uh, you're muted. Here we go, I, I just unmuted you. Okay, um, thank you for joining us and I hope that you'll be able to share uh, this webinar with others. Um, you know, everyone just take a time to breathe. Um, we're all in stressful times and just slow it down, slow the pace down and I know the anxiety is high, um, but one thing that we've learned is what is essential and what is non-essential. And it's essential that you're healthy, right? It's essential that you move forward and you're proactive with your uh, education. And so uh, seniors celebrate. I, I know you're not, you can't celebrate like you want to because of COVID-19, but let's make some lemon out of lemonade and celebrate. We celebrate with you. Um, and, and focus on, you know, um, going to college and making those decisions and, um, you know, why you may not be able to have that party of graduation, start your li wish list of what you need so you can pay some of those deposits and, you know, get into that re residential hall, but also be prepared to take classes online. Um, this time is preparing you for that. For your juniors, this is a time for you to get ready. This is essential for you to um, commit to you, right? Commit to your education and write the plan, work the plan so that you can be successful moving forward. To counselors, have hats out to you, off to you. Um, continue to stay engaged. I know that we're looking at opportunities where we can provide some advice and some tools that you need to, to help your students and uh, pass the message along to the teachers, uh, parents, remain engaged with your with your your child through this journey um, and we're here to provide support so best wishes to you all thank you very much both and thank you very much everyone for listening to us today uh, we really appreciate it please stay in touch this 
uh, this is a very dynamic times that we live in, in college admissions and standardized testing. Our information that we just presented to you have been updated just today. Uh, and the pre presentation we just did two days ago was different. So it is different for every single time. And we're offering more webinars uh, open to the public. They're available as early as tomorrow and as late as next week. So please follow us on social media and follow through our next set of webinars. Thank you for joining us today. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Thanks for joining. Have a great day.